Greetings to all our friends and guests. Welcome to the Ancient Order Hibernians in America live webinar, Make Britain Keep Promises of Legacy Justice. I'm Danny O'Connell, National President of the Ancient Order Hibernians in America. I wish to thank all of our guests today, as well as our audience from around the United States, around Ireland, the North Ireland and the United Kingdom. I believe the most important thing for us to take away from today's session is the British government is once again preparing to simply ignore and walk away from an international treaty. I personally can't understand why any country would wish to enter an agreement with them until they begin to honor their prior commitments. At this time, I'm extremely happy to welcome the Ancient Order of Hibernians in America, Freedom for Ireland Chairman, Martin Galvin. Danny, thank you and thank everybody for being on the panel. This is a very important event. We didn't expect these laws to come so soon. I just want to point out what the new laws would do so everybody has in mind what we're dealing with as we listen to the particular people talk about how it's going to affect them individually as for the political parties for their reaction. Number one, the British have said there will be an amnesty on all criminal prosecutions. They're primarily concerned with the British Army, members of the RUC and others. They were never really investigated. They were members, murders by them, killings by them were never really investigated. If you were a Republican, if you're a loyalist paramilitary, even perhaps you would have been investigated by the RUC. There would have been some attempt for justice. That didn't happen for the British Army. The British are gonna move on that. More important than that, that instead of just an amnesty, which means that the killers of those of, of Bally Murphy or Spring Hill West Rock that we're going to talk about are Bloody Sunday can never be punished now. They have said, embarrassed by the inquest of Bloody Sunday, we'll just do away with them to make sure, sorry, the inquest for Bally Murphy, we'll just do away with that, make sure they never happen again, never have those types of investigation. They said they're embarrassed by civil actions, people suing and getting information. And you'll hear about some of those actions. They'll just do away with that, make sure that that doesn't happen again. They took the Storm and House Agreement, six years old. You've heard about the Time for Truth Appeal, other initiatives that we've had, an agreement with the Irish government from more than six and a half years ago now. Key part was a historical investigations unit that could actually investigate, maybe for the first time, a lot of the killings, a lot of issues of collusion, some of the other things that nationalists have been victims have been fighting around. They'll take that out, take, cut out the heart of the Storm and House Agreement, and they'll give you an oral history archive. The only difference, they said, it's just like South Africa, except for one difference in South Africa to get an amnesty, to get anything, you had to go in and tell the whole story beforehand before you'd be judged worthy of an amnesty. Uh, in this one, the British one, you get the amnesty first, which means no one will ever have any reason to go in and tell the story of any crimes that they committed. That's the statute that we're dealing with now that the British have proposed. The Irish government, all of the Irish political parties, including unionist parties, have opposed it. Uh, we're going to consider that in the context of some of the incidents which uh, we have members of the panel representing. With that, I'll turn to Jacqueline Butler. She is going to, her father was one of the victims of the Spring Hill, or I should say Spring Hill West Rock massacre. January 9th, um, just last week, they celebrated the 49th anniversary. Jacqueline, where is Spring Hill West Rock in relation to, say, Bally Murphy in Belfast? They're so close together. They're like two parallel streets. So Bally Murphy's one street, and the next street on would be Spring Hill West Rock. So they're so close together. Now, you were the youngest of six children in 1972. Well, you're still the youngest of six children in 1972. I uh, should set a background. There was a, a ceasefire. There were talks of peace at that time. A Republican delegation had actually been flown to Ireland, uh, led by Sean McStephan, uh, Jerry Adams, Ivor Bell, Seamus Toomey, Dahi O'Connell, and Martin McGinnis were involved. They came back on, that was on January 7th. They came back. There was hope that this would be expanded, that we could have a real solution, real peace. And instead, the ceasefire broke down on July 8th. What happened on July 9th to your father, to the parish priest, to others in the Spring Hill West Rock area that's known as the Spring Hill Massacre? 
Well, on the 9th of July, um, the ceasefire broke down and there was a, a gun battle in Lenadoon, which would be about three miles away from Spring Hill West Rock. Um, the IRA had the army pinned down and um, there were heavy gun, it was a heavy gun fight and the army were struggling to get control of Lenadoon. In Spring Hill, well, in West Strack, um, a car pulled up and three young men were starting um, chatting. And one of them opened the boot and the other two looked in, were looking into the boot when from an army um, in Corey's Timber Yard, there was an association post and there was marksmen on that protecting the timber yard and rounds were fired and the three young fellas were shot. Okay, you say a marksman, you're saying British Army marksman, is that correct? It's, it was, yes, Army marksman. Okay, and then how did your father and the local priest get involved or respond to these three young people being shot? Well, my father done a lot with the chapel and Father Fitzpatrick was a new priest to the, the neighborhood and um he was he knew my daddy so he knocked on our door and asked my, my daddy for help that um he didn't know a way to get to the injured and could my daddy show him a safe route to right, get what happened when they arrived well the priest had a white hanky and went out waving the white hanky and shot wrong out. And my daddy went to Paul Fuller, no, Fitzpatrick back in, and the two of them were shot dead. Okay. And there were five people all together. Three teenagers were also killed. How, how did that happen? David McCaffrey. John Dougal was one of the young fellas starting by the car that... Um, my father and Father Noah were trying to get to help. And David McCaffrey tried to get um, to the Father Fitzpatrick on my daddy's body to pull them back in and he was shot dead. And young Margaret Gargan was 13, a 13 year old school girl. And she was with her two friends. And they run, when they heard the shots, they run for cover and Margaret was shot, um, shot dead as well. All right, now why, what reason did the British government give for saying that these shootings were all justified? What did they say about your father, the priest holding the handkerchief, the three teenagers who were killed? They were in, the, in a local newspaper, the Belfast Telegraph, they were named as five gun men, all dressed in black, that were shot dead because they had attacked um, the army. All right, and... In addition, after that, this wasn't the end of it. Your father was taken away, six children. Uh, the British government or British troops, when they came in after that, you, they put your family through an ordeal because of this incident. What happened to your family afterwards? Yes, because my, my daddy was shot dead and it was said that he was a gunman. We were terrorized for years up until the, the 80s. And, two, three o'clock in the morning when a new regiment came in. Um, we were knocked out of our beds, made to sit on the settee. The house was ransacked. My mother was questioned. My father and um, Father Patrick's memory card was spit on by British soldiers. Um, there's some, some weeks it was five nights in a row. Some was one night, but three, four o'clock in the morning, I was, we were lifted from our bed. I was 20 months old when my daddy died and my mommy was left widowed with six young children and had no time to grieve because we, she was terrorized. Right, now, you and the people of Spring Hill, West Rock, all of the families, the neighbors, everybody have been fighting just for an inquest, the same thing that they got in Bally Murphy, just to tell the truth, remove the cloud that your father and the priest, teenagers were gunmen, to show the truth of what happened. What stage is that at? And what would it mean if for now, if it was declared under British law that you no longer had the right to that inquest that, that you've been waiting for? 
Well, we were lucky enough two weeks ago to hear that my daddy's inquest would be next year. But then this week we found out that Boris Johnson is trying to move this forward. So none of us get um, get a, an inquest and get the truth out there and finally clear my father's name that he wasn't a gunman. He was a good Hard working family man just helping, trying to help somebody that was hurt and injured. And he was a good man, he wasn't a good man, and that's all we want. All right. And what would you and the people of Spring Hill Rest Rock, you've had a long campaign, you've waiting for that inquest. What would you like Irish America, what would you like the politicians, the Irish government, all the representatives that are here to do uh, it, to help you? We just want the pressure kept on and to make sure that Boris Johnson doesn't get away with us. He's trying to cover up all his, all the army's wrongdoings instead of just holding his hands up, accepting what happened and uh, apologizing to people. And it's just not our campaign. There is h- hundreds of families just wanting the truth. That's all people want. We just want the truth and our loved one's names cleared. And for the British government to say, sorry, sorry, what we did was wrong. We accept it was wrong. And that's what we want. We want justice for our family. All right. Thank you, Jacqueline, uh, for coming on with us. We're next going to turn to Miami show band survivor, uh, Stephen Travers. That was actually in two weeks from now, it will be the 47th, I believe, anniversary of the Miami show band massacre. Stephen, you were actually in a band. I think you were called the Irish Beatles. Uh, You played all sorts of music. You had members in the band. You played rock music. You had, the band had seven number one hits in Ireland, I believe. Uh, You had one member of the band who was, his father was in the Orange Order. They're non-political. You'd actually played a gig or an event or performance in Banbridge, which is a town that's two thirds majority unionist. Um, You're on your way back to Dublin that night. You get stopped by a patrol of the Ulster Defense Regiment, uh, which is a regiment of the British Army. You put aside of the road, you're cooperating with them. This is something commonplace. And actually somebody that you believe was an English officer came along could you just take us and you, they were some joking back and forth. There were people at the back of the car. Uh, you expected that they would let you go, that you would proceed on, take the next night off. What happened from that point on to the Miami show band, the event that's known as the Miami show band massacre? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to tell my story. Uh, I must add, however, that the her- uh, horrific as my story is, it must not be held up in isolation to use as a stick to beat any one community because since terrible atrocities were committed against both communities and anyone who had hand act or part in any of these atrocities must be held accountable. Yes, we were a a very, very popular band. Uh, We certainly weren't the Beatles, Um, uh, but we love the Beatles. Uh, Either way, either way, um, uh, we didn't have a sectarian bone in our bodies. We knew nothing about politics. Uh, I came from South Tipperary, so uh, the troubles may have been a million miles away. Uh, On that particular night, uh, we were stopped, as you say, and we were asked um, to get out. The plan was to plant a 10 pound bomb under the driver's seat. And we would then be told to, thanks very much for your cooperation and off you go. And um, the bomb, according to forensics, would have exploded about 10 to 15 minutes on the way home, maybe perhaps in in the center of Newry or just crossing the border. So we would have been gone down in history as terrorists. And that, to me, is an even worse uh, sentence than than death. Uh, But while they were planting the bomb under the driver's seat, two men unfortunately blew themselves up and there was very, there was nothing left of them and uh, lifted me into the air and I was blown into the field, uh, which was, we were standing in front of this field with our hands on our heads and I fell down into the, about three meters down into the field. And the others, some of the others fell on top of me as well. The band, uh, the bandwagon, as you, the Volkswagen minibus, as you can see from a lot of the photographs now, was completely annihilated. Um, and when I hit the ground, the others got up and they tried to drag me out into the further into the field to safety. Uh, but I was already shot. I had been shot by what they call a dum dum bullet, which exploded on impact, uh, 
went and uh, exploded into 16 pieces inside me and exited under my left arm. So I had very, very bad injuries. Um, while they were dragging me out, uh, one of them, which we now think was uh, Brian McCoy, one of the Protestant lads in our band, although I didn't know what religion they were until afterwards, um, he was murdered. He was shot in the back of the head and the back and the hands and the arms were trying to save me. The, the irony of that shouldn't be missed. Um, the other two lads, Fran O'Toole, our lead singer, was, was shot, given a particularly bad death. He was, I heard them all scream for help, uh, scream not to be shot. And uh, they shot Fran 22 times, seven of those were in the face. And they shot my friend, a great friend, a guitar player, um, a number of times in the back of the head. And uh, I pretended to be dead. And when the screaming stopped, uh, this particular soldier walked around. Uh, there was a number of them in the field. I'll never forget. There's two things I'll always remember. One was the, the obscenities of the soldiers, uh, the cursing and swearing as they kicked the bodies to make sure they were dead and firing into the dead bodies. And also the, the smell of burning blood. Um, and one of the soldiers walked over to me and uh, I pretended to be dead. I kept my face against, against the ground and uh, I was expecting him to fire into me. Uh, and he didn't for some reason or other um, Somebody on the, on the road shouted down, uh, uh, come on, those bastards are dead. I got them with dum-dums. Right. Now, uh, Stephen, let me... turned away. Okay. Um, you thought a number of those people were members of the Ulster Defense Regiment, but there were also others. They were just loyalist paramilitaries. There's a belief that Robin Jackson was involved in the incident. I believe fingerprints were linked to it. Uh, the Glen Ann gang, which was involved with 120 killings, including the Dublin Monaghan bombings. But for a long time, you were of the belief that it was just a few bad apples in the also defense regiment of the British Army cooperating. Uh, how did you come to believe that it was much higher than that? And you take your case right to suing the British Ministry of Defense and the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Yeah, so one correction there, um, uh, we now know that everybody that we know of, and we know there were, we, uh, there were three uh, convictions and two involuntary suicides, if that's the right term to use, we now know that every single one of the people that we know of uh, uh, were either serving members of the UDR or uh, had been serving members, including Robin Jackson. Uh, and uh, also, uh, every single weapon associated with the killing of the Miami show band originated from the security forces. So we know this uh, further down the road. I mean, yes, you're right. Uh, I, it wasn't that I, I, I didn't believe, I didn't want to believe that, that, um, that uh, a country, a friendly country, uh, our neighboring country uh, would, would target me and shoot me or the kill our lads. Uh, I, I just didn't want to believe it. But then I was... Uh, I was faced with uh, just evidence, especially uh, from uh, unearthed by Margaret Orwin from the Justice for the Forgotten Group, and then the HET, the Historical Inquiries team, and the evidence was just so overwhelming that uh, that I had to I had to uh, accept that this was collusion between uh, the British British Army and in in fact at the incident itself, one of our lads uh, nudged my arm and said, "Don't worry." Steve, this is a British army. And I, I reported that at the time of the end, uh, at the first trials. And I was told by the, uh, by the uh, uh, prosecution counsel who should have been on our side that it wasn't relevant. So all of these things played into it. I have absolutely no, no doubt whatsoever now that it went right to the top. And that's why we've taken a court case against the MOD and the, the chief counsel of the PSNI. And in the new British proposals, they say they're going to terminate uh, any kind of civil actions. They, may, they won't be allowing investigations. You had a historical inquiries team investigation. Um, they won't be allowing those in future through a historical investigations uh, unit, which they had agreed with the Irish government. What did that mean to you if you couldn't proceed with your civil case, if you had not been allowed the historical investigations that you did have? First of all, they can't. Um, they can't retrospectively uh, cancel a, a case that's going. That's already. They, they say they might. I, I don't know if they can or not, but uh, well, they say they, they might in the document. Yeah, well, they say they say they say a lot of things. They can't do that. Either way, I do feel sorry for those who who will be denied or per perhaps could be denied future uh, cases. If uh, uh, let me put it this way, the consequences of that. They say that over the gates of hell, they're uh, written a number of words, abandon hope all ye who enter here. Now what they've done here 
uh, is they've tried to take away the one thing that sustained all the people, whether they were impacted by, by, by either side, whether it was by, by loyalist state or Republican violence. They've, the one thing that sustained them has been hope, and they've tried to take that away. They must not be allowed to take that away. When you consider last week, Last week, or sorry, last year, there was a, a 93-year-old uh, um, Nazi uh, war criminal. Uh, he, was, he was convicted of over 2,000 um, counts of accessory to murder. And he was 93. And I just wonder if the British government would have tried to stop that case. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. It's, uh, it's, it's a, an abomination against the law. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Steve, we're next going to turn to East Tyrone and Martin Mallon. Martin, if you unmute. Okay. Uh, Martin, your aunt, Roseanne, I believe she was 76. She was killed in a section of East Tyrone. It would be a Republican heartland. It would be very difficult for anybody who was not a Republican to know that area to get to. And immediately everybody said that killing is one of a string of 17 killings. Um, They talked about the hallmarks of collusion, meaning British forces would have been directly involved with those people, went to their house, killed her, fired shots at your mother. What are some of the things in that case, your aunt's case, that uh, you would point to that led you believe right away that there was collusion? Um, Firstly, I would have been identified by the Korean forces or what you call RUC or British Army as a Republican in that area. So we would have been continually harassed, swept and searched. It would have got that bad at times you wouldn't even pick your family in the camera because it was that dangerous. So th- that continued from 93 to 94 from I was released from Long Cash. I was in for the political prisoner in it. And um, finally, they were threatening about killing you and what way they were going to do it. And um, on 8th of May 94, it, it finally happened. Um, the, under the name of the UVF, they shot up my mother's house. My mother was 60 years of age. She was injured in the arm and the leg. Roseanne, my aunt, lived with her, and she was um, 76 year old. She was shot dead. Um, we immediately said that this was collusion, and it was portrayed as Republican propaganda. Um, this, the day before the shooting, the 7th of May, two young boys had came across six armed gunmen within 600 metres of my mother's house. They reported that with their families to the police. And in fact, the next morning, the very day Roussan was shot, they went to the Dungannon police station and made a statement. The police at that stage told them they believed it was an unidentified regiment of the British Army. We asked what was an unidentified regiment of the British Army doing within 600 metres of my mother's house the night before the shooting. Secondly, the weapon was found and the forensic people said that there was only one shooting on the weapon. And that was the weapon that shot Roussan. After 24 years, now at that time, they were talking about an inquest coming up within a year because Roussan was a 76 year old pensioner, innocent person. Within a very short space of time, the inquest was up. The weapon was there, the forensic sitting there. The next thing, two months later, on the 11th of July, a local farmer came across. British Army cameras overlooking my mother's house. And the question we asked was, was these cameras monitoring my mother's house when she was injured and my aunt was shot dead? This went on for 24 years, asking these questions. Every time we went down to the inquest, every time we came up the road, we were stopped, we were taken out of the car, we were searched, the houses were raided. It got that bad that Martin McGuinness had to even to intervene. Your phone was taken, your record was taken. They were applying as much pressure as they could so you yep. wouldn't continue with the inquest. And at that time, we had asked, Wait, what was behind this? Now, what was behind this was, there is a statement, okay. a statement from a detective chief constable who states that he, put, he gave permission to put the camera in one month before Roussan was killed. So that camera was in monitoring our house and they have seen what happened. Now I have to show you this. There is another statement from a British soldier called Soldier Acts. And he states that he was a British army presently attached in England. 
And at that time, he was in Chili Meal Barracks in Dungannon. And what he said was he was monitoring the situation that day. And when he heard the bust of gunfire, he reported it. And he was told not to intervene or arrest anybody that the RUC would deal with it. Secondly, for the government, I was ordered to turn the camera off that night. And the reason why I was ordered to turn the camera off that night was because there was a police and armed person in the area. When the whole, when the evidence came out about 15 years into the inquest, an English policeman from the HET, maybe even more, 15, 18 years into the inquest, an English policeman from the HET made a call to one of our people here. And he stated that we had been told lies in the court that this weapon was actually involved in more than 13 people and injuring two people. The judge, who was Reginald Weir, who was dealing with the inquest at the time, asked how this could happen. Work, WERC, was the body, the forensic body, that had examined these weapons for MI5 and special brand, and who had drafted the weapon so it couldn't be placed to the rest of the murder. Hey, now, Martin, Martin uh, the weapons have now been linked. Are you getting that information at the inquest? A total of 17 killings, including Liam Ryan, an American citizen, a total of 17 killings that began in 1988. Your aunt was killed in 1994, including Pauline Quinn's brother, including a number of other people. And yet there's been no investigation to tie up to see those weapons. How is it that there's, you know, that there was no investigation and whose hands were those weapons in? Who were using those weapons? They seem to be tied to the Ulster Defense Regiment and then they seem tied directly to uh, unionist, to uh, loyalist paramilitaries. Well, well, firstly, the weapons was taken into the north by Brian Nelson, a British agent from South Africa. And these were the people through MI5 and Special Branch that armed their agents like Billy Wright who was, a paid, who was a paid agent by Special Branch and MI5. An examination related to several murders and attempted murders in 88 and 91 highlighted concerns to several members of the UDR. There was four UDR members arrested in December 91. They were taken in for questioning for the shooting of the four people in Chapa, Tommy Casey and some of the other people. In 92, two months later, there was a number of weapons handed over to the PSNA by these people. They were handed over in coke. After that, the UDR men, has, we know their names. The, the UDR men hasn't been arrested. They haven't been you know, taken in for questioning. They were given a free run. Now, what I would say to you very clear, with the exception of inquests, working with your good legal team, relatives for justice and these people, we would never have got near any of this information. It would have been covered up, and that's why we were continually harassed right through the whole period, because they didn't want us. Our legal teams here in the North has got very, very well educated in the way to approach these, with the aid of Relatives for Justice and the Pat Manukin Spender. Mark Thompson, Andre Morphy, Clara Riley, they guided us from day one here on what way they'll approach us to approach this case. And the legal teams would turn around and say to you, only for these people and their knowledge and the work that they've done, we would never have got near a lot of this stuff that was going on. All right, Martin, I want to thank you. We'll leave it there. And just with the idea that you were counting on, uh, all the groups were counting on a historical investigations unit to get discovery, to try and follow that up. And now it seems with these new laws, the British want to shut down not only historical investigations that they agreed six years ago with the Irish government, but any kind of proceedings that could allow for the discovery, the information that you got and that could investigate while there are 17 killings, same weapons, perhaps we could find tie in and, and find who was responsible. All right, with that note, I'm gonna tie it, turn it back to Danny O'Connell for a second. Thank you, Martin. We are the Ancient Order Hibernians in America and we will have an opportunity for all the participations in today's webinar to ask questions via chat and the Q and A feature following our next segment with our political leaders committed to justice and the Good Friday Agreement. Today's webinar echoes the need for the United States to reappoint a special envoy for the North of Ireland as soon as possible. I know our next speaker has been a staunch advocate for such an envoy 
and for all things, ju all the justice issues in Ireland. Brendan Boyle is a U.S. Congressman, rec represented Pennsylvania's second district. He is a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians in America and the recipient of the AOH, LAOH, John F. Kennedy uh, uh, medallion. Up next, Congressman Boyle. How are you, Brendan? Well, it's great to see you. Uh, it's great to see you again, Danny. I hope uh, you can hear me okay. And yeah. I, I've uh, just um, been moved and captivated by the last uh, half hour or so. Um, I, I first just want to say my my sympathies, my empathies go out to all of the victims' families uh, who, over the last several decades, have shown such remarkable resiliency, strength, and courage. And uh, my, my heart is, is with them, um, truly remarkable people, what they've been through and yet how they continue to, to fight. And as Stephen said, to not lose hope. Uh, I also just want to applaud uh, the AOH for your leadership in moving forward with this webinar. Uh, it shows you how that valuable Irish American presence is needed on this issue like it's needed on so many others. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, we're going to give our opportunity uh, for our panel to ask any questions you may have. Uh, Martin, do you have a follow up for Brendan? Brendan, do you think it would be possible to get some kind of congressional letter, something like that, to show support for these families? They are counting on American support. They believe the British government doesn't care about the fact that all of the political parties in Ireland in the North want don't want these changes. Uh, they seem to ignore the fact of the Irish government, they'll have talks and then announce the next day while the talks are ongoing that they're gonna go forward with this. Right. But they seem to care about America. Is there something like that, a congressional letter to the ambassador, some kind of protest that we could have in Congress that all of the uh, Irish American groups could work on and support that, that could make a difference for these people? Yeah, Martin, I, I certainly would be willing to, to sign such a letter and, and try to get others as well if, they, if AOH wants to lead and make that push, you'll certainly have my 100% uh, support. I can tell you that months ago, when Brandon Lewis wanted to um, meet with a, a group of us from the Friends of Ireland Caucus, it was right after uh, word of this had leaked. And when he was on that meeting, um, his essential reply was, don't believe what you read in the papers. This is premature. Uh, this is, it has been misreported. Uh, well, here it is months later, and what they announced in Parliament is almost verbatim what was in uh, that, that news article. Uh, and, and don't worry, I, many of us who were in that meeting did not necessarily uh, find that credible at the time, and obviously it, it wasn't. Uh, but something that um, was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, either by you or by Danny, is that, you know, uh, the British government does care, obviously, about uh, the United States. Um, there is the possibility of a US-UK free trade agreement, but the US matters even for reasons beyond that. Um, they certainly, whether it's the Secretary of State or David, uh, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State or David Frost or the British Embassy, they certainly do spend a lot of time attempting to reach out to a number of us. So that's why I issued my statement. I, I will continue to do all that I can. I, I know there's a group of us who feel as strongly on that um, in, in the House as well as in the Senate. And um, so I, I'm certainly uh, willing to play whatever role it can be to attempt to block this. And this is um, not to go on, but there's one other point that I wanna make. And I made this on uh, RT earlier this yeah. week. This is not just a typical British government, this British government that's in power now, unlike many of the previous others, um, is really pandering to an extreme, very far right wing base. And this is at least the third time now in the last year that they have ripped up uh, an agreement that was previously reached a, a couple of times in the protocol. It was an agreement that they had negotiated and signed. And now you hear, you have here this announcement, which goes back on 20 years worth of agreements between British and Irish governments and local parties. Um, so uh, this is a, a really uh, dangerous step that harms not just the cause of justice and the victims' families,
but does so much more harm than that. Congressman, thank you. I just want you to know when we were calling around to different groups to organize this, a number of them right away asked about Brendan Boyle. They said he's the guy who speaks up and, and they appreciate and they look to you for your leadership in Congress. That's the people from Ireland. So thank you. Danny. Thank you. And Brenda, just as a follow up, I was going to mention that RTE interview. Every hour on the hour yesterday, we had a Brendan Boyle. And I think the fact that RTE comes to you as almost a U.S. spokesman on these issues really demonstrates your commitment to, um, to the whole peace process. But I also know that um, months ago, you led the way um, when, when we had the call for um, you know, no trade agreement unless we honored a Good Friday agreement. And I just, do you wanna uh, kind of give us maybe an update on that and any thoughts you have on, uh, on the uh, special envoy appointment, which we hear is just around the corner. Yeah, so uh, first, Danny, I, I strongly support the appointment of a special envoy. Um, I have for the last, uh, I've, my service in Congress now has overlapped three different administrations. I first pressed uh, the Secretary of State, John Kerry, toward the tail end of the Obama administration on why one was necessary. This was pre-Brexit and post-Brexit, and I, I pushed for it then continued to push for it in the Trump administration, was glad that uh, my former House colleague, Mick Mulvaney, uh, was appointed there. Uh, I, I think that with all of the issues that Brexit has prompted combined with this, a special envoy is absolutely needed, can do some good. Uh, it doesn't take the place of ultimately the local parties having to reach agreements and, and work together, but it can help facilitate that. And I, I am optimistic that you will see action on a, a special envoy soon. Um, now, in terms of the prospect of a free trade agreement, I'm a member of the House uh, Ways and Means Committee. We have jurisdiction over that. There are a number of us who um, are proud Irish Americans who are on that committee and who have been active on making sure that we uh, promote peace and pursue justice in all of Ireland. And um, certainly uh, I will not be interested in any prospective free trade agreement if uh, the UK is continuing to reach agreements and then violate them. We wanna make sure the protocol is fully implemented. Um, the protocol is necessary because of the form of Brexit, not just because of Brexit, but because of the form of Brexit that this government chose, which was the most hard-lined type of Brexit you could have. They chose to move away from alignment with the EU in so many areas. So that makes the protocol necessary. We want to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement in letter and spirit is fully upheld. Um, and so that uh, continues to be a major priority. Well, thank you, uh, Brendan. Your, your work on the issues of Ireland have been second to none. And of course, I know that makes mom and dad proud. I think Everyone here knows that Brendan Boyle is the only member of the U.S. Congress whose parents were both born in Ireland, right? Either parents, for that matter. And so he's first generation Irish America working to continue the, the historic relationship that the United States has had with Ireland. And we're so proud of the work you do on these issues. Moving next is uh, a member from the Irish government, the Department of Foreign Affairs someone who it seems like last week came to New York and here it is, his term is over and he's getting ready to move, move on. And we're gonna hear next from Karen Madden, Ireland Council General for New York. Thank you, Danny. And thank you and Martin and the AOH for including me in today's discussion. You refer to this as the political panel. I'll be the apolitical part of that panel, of course. Um, You've seen the reaction from Ireland's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, on to Wednesday's announcement by the British government. Clearly, we disagree with the proposals as they have been published. They don't meet the, meet the need of victims. They're unworkable. And as has already been said, I think, by Martin, a general statute of limitations that effectively becomes an amnesty doesn't have the support of parties in Northern Ireland. We've heard from already from more important voices than mine this morning on these issues Jacqueline and Stephen and Martin, and thank you for, for, for telling your stories here in the US, even virtually today. And the proposals would add to the uncertainty and upset of decades and would push that out further.
But I suppose it's important to remember that they are just the, what they are, proposals. They were published in the context of the process launched at the end of last month by Simon Coveney and Brandon Lewis at the, after the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference. And while, you, while ever, I think everyone on this call disagrees with them, at least they're out there now. Before they're out there as leaks, now they're out there and you can push back against them, you can respond specifically to them and voice your opposition to them. For us, the starting point remains the Stormont House agreement. And if there's no agreement collectively on a way, on a way forward, the, the, the Stormont House agreement and its implementation is also our ending point. Simon Coveney, you may have seen, published an article in The Guardian in London yesterday. And on Stormont House, he said, those who would criticise it have a very high bar to clear to provide a workable and sustainable alternative that is clearly better. The Stormont House Agreement was reached collectively. It required compromise, it required careful balancing of different demands and needs. And that's how these things are done. And it cannot be simply set aside. The process announced by Simon Coveney and Brandon Lewis at the end of last month is also supposed to be collective and inclusive. And there's no room for, in that for, collect, for unilateral action. Um, as has already been mentioned by Congressman Boyle, um, unilateral action by the British government in other areas has already caused enough friction between London and Dublin and between London and Brussels. I know that Deputy Neil Richmond has been in the middle of responding to that over the last couple of years also. And we don't want to go down that road now in relation to legacy. And the issue is, is, is more than just about statute of limitations. It's about governmental responsibility under law. They have a legal ob obligation to investigate crimes perpetrated in their jurisdiction and to provide victims with, with, with effective remedies. It, it is, I suppose, it's been said so often about justice. So the obvious question, and I suppose not, not to the, is what can you do? I mean, those who are listening in, not the panellists. I think the most useful thing to do is make some noise, make a lot of noise. As demonstrated by Brendan Boyle and mentioned by both Danny and Martin Galvin, the US voice on this, as on so many issues, is enormously important. So the more voices that can be mobilised, the better. I've said it in different places before. The AOH reaches places in this country that we as a diplomatic network cannot do. So it's now time, I think, for the membership to use your extraordinary reach. Our message now is to get the process right. It has to include the parties. It has to include the victims. It has to include experts. And how we address the full range of legacy issues. Um, as mentioned by Stephen Travers, it, 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 it's a cross-community. How, how, how we address those issues has to be done collectively. Unilateral action is not right and it's not sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Karen. We have a couple questions for you, but, uh, you know, as you talk about being apolitical, I just would remind everybody that the ancient order of Hibernian does not support any political parties. We don't support any political candidates. But just as importantly, we don't oppose any political party or any political candidate. And that's important to remember as we're uh, moving forward and moving to Belfast to hear from our good friend, Mark Thompson. Hi, Donny. Firstly, a big thank you once again to everybody at the AOH, the LAOH and the Freedom for All Ireland Committee for these webinars that have been taking place over the last couple of years. They've been excellent and informative and have been of great assistance in terms of us building the kind of collegiate and collective approach around these issues. And in particular, I want to thank Jacqueline, Stephen and Martin for speaking from their hearts today and, and, and sharing with us being privileged to listen for them to share their experiences and the horrendous things that have happened. I suppose, and I want to thank Congressman Boyle as well in terms of his ongoing support. I want to, to say that the proposals made on Wednesday are a direct threat to the Good Friday Agreement. During the course of the conflict, the state acted with de facto impunity. They colluded with loyalism, they armed them, they infiltrated the IRA with Freddie involved in all of those war crimes and their soldiers, their agents, none of them were held to account. In fact, in contrast, 25,000 Republicans spent around 130,000 years in jail and several thousand loyalists spent several thousand years in jail. Four British soldiers spent a collective of 12 years in jail convicted of murder. The British state murdered 400 people whilst in uniform. The vast majority uninvolved civilians over 60 school children, two priests, and through collusion, we estimate that they've probably killed close to a thousand people. Take 
the Miami show band and the Glen Ann gang is just one example. Take the Oma bomb and the infiltration of agents there as well that could have prevented that. The case of Pat Fanuc and Rosemary Nelson, advocates that were, that were killed because they stood up for human rights. And in the course of trying to redress that in the context of the peace process, the important, the important foundation that was part of the peace process, and it's very important to remember this, was the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic legislation in the North called the Human Rights Act in 1998. That enabled families to assert their rights for the first time ever to seek a remedy for their loss and for their experience, to use the domestic courts in Belfast in a way under the convention to which the British could not stop. They could not use immunity. They could not use the national security. They were, more, they were inhibited from doing that. And that provided families, like the Ball Murphy families and the outcome we've seen recently, to go forward, where inquests could call witnesses, get the evidence, call soldiers, scrutinize it, and get to the bottom of it. And what happened in terms of the British in, over the last number of years, they agreed the Stormont House Agreement under the context of the European Convention on Human Rights and Article 2, which gives families the right to proper effective remedy. And Article 2 is a major problem for the British. And so on one full sweep, they've pulled it out from under as a foundation plank from the Good Friday Agreement. So what they've done in these proposals is they've threatened the integrity of the Good Friday Agreement, and they have taken away the equality and the rights that were enshrined in that agreement, an agreement only arrived at because of the intervention of the United States as an honest broker. And that is all under threat. The central tenant of equality, justice, and rights at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement has been torn out of it by these proposals. We have a window of three months, three months in which to try and turn this around and we need the Irish government and all the political parties and people right across the community. But in particular, we need the US support, the political support to say to Britain, you've charted on a course, you're heading in the wrong direction. You need to come back in the right side of the line and you need to do the right thing. These proposals need bend and you need to stick fast to the agreement you made in 2014, which provides the rights of victims right across the entire community, affected by all the participants to the conflict. And that's what Britain is trying to avoid, and we shouldn't allow them away with it. So for Irish America, we have a three-month window until October till legislation goes before the British Parliament to, to, to get it turned around. And we, we, for all the families and everything that people have been hearing down the years, now is the time to act. This threatens the Good Friday institutions. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Mark. At this time, uh, panelists, we are, uh, as we go through our speakers, we're going to have questions for the speakers. Uh, and then there will be a time for panelists uh, to speak at the end. Uh, we want we have a tight schedule with our speakers. Some of them have other events. Uh, John DC for the purpose of a question for Karen Madden. You're muted, John. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll make a very a uh, couple of very quick points. Um, Firstly, just to go back to what Mr. Travers said, um, and he made a, sorry, excuse me. Can you hear me, Danny? Yes, sir. Um, he, he made an analogy with regards to the Second World War and the prosecution of murders that occurred in the Second World War. And I think you could, um, Take it a bit further than that from the standpoint of if you make a comparison here, um, if you were to stop the prosecutions of murders that were committed in the Second World War, the Simon Wiesenthal Center would have been shut down 50 years ago. And I think it's an argument actually that would resonate in Congress um, with not just Irish American lawmakers, but also um, across the board in both, both chambers and both houses. Um, just to go back to what Brendan Boyle mentioned, a few points that I think people um, would have picked up on. Firstly, this is uh, not a typical British government. And I think people are getting the sense, a very strong sense of that over the last few months, not just with this issue, 
but there is a sense that um, Britain is beginning to assert itself in very unusual ways. Um, for example, making it clear that it wasn't going to repay the European Union the 40 odd billion euros that is owed to the European Union. Um, I think that in, when I look at the um, uh, yes, go, go, go. Sorry, I got my seven-year-old son with me now. So if you hear any screaming in the background, you know what it is, okay? Thank you. Um, I I think that. Um, I th sorry, 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 and sorry. Hi, I'm Cal. Just go downstairs, okay? John, okay. your your mic might be too close to your speaker. We're getting some feedback here. Hang on one second, Denny. Okay, we're, what we'll do, uh, John, we're going to come back to you. We're going to move to uh, Ambassador Susan Elliott, and then we'll move forward. Well, thanks, Danny, for including me in today's discussion. And first, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the president and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, uh, an organization that back in the 1990s helped get the Irish peace process started under the leadership of Bill Flynn, who was the chairman of our board of trustees at the time. Um, but I also was U.S. Consul General in Belfast, so I understand the importance of having a special envoy. At the time I was there, it was in the George W. Bush administration. Paula Dobryansky was the uh, special envoy. But during uh, my time here at the NCAFP, we also interacted with Mick Mulvaney. And I do agree with what Danny said. This is not a Democratic or a Republican issue, but it's a bipartisan issue. And I'd also just like to thank and second everything that Congressman Boyle has said, because I think uh, keeping America involved because of the importance of the relationship, not only with the Republic of Ireland, but with the, um, you know, with the United Kingdom, without a strong voice to support the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and to support uh, the kinds of issues that all of you have um, taken and expressed today, um, you know, it will be difficult. So thanks to all of you, especially to Martin, Jacqueline and Stephen for sharing your stories. And um, I look forward to working with you more in the future. So thanks. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, now we have an opportunity to hear from a new friend of the AOH, Neil Richmond, TD from Ireland, representing the Dublin Rathdown constituency. Neil, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to participate um, this morning slash this afternoon for some of us. And I must say it was a real honor um, to share the platform for the for the for the speakers and to share their testimony after decades of hurt that they and their families have gone through. And just to be reminded of how important seeking justice is for everyone on this island and indeed our extended families in diaspora worldwide. And I think it is remarkable. And I think uh, Martin referred to it in his opening remarks that the statement by the British government this week is one of the most unifying statements uh, in the history of Anglo-Irish relations in terms of it unified every single political party on the island of Ireland. It unified the entire opposition uh, in Great Britain. And I'd like to think it unified every single person in Irish America and beyond. And it is as Brendan, my good friend Brendan Boyle said, it's it's part of a very worrying, continuing worrying unilateral trend. And whilst um, Kieran Madden in his diplomatic tone said he was providing the apolitical voice, there's, there's very little I would have to add to what Kieran said. And the strength of opinion in the Irish government is match, it matches, I would argue, the strength of opinion throughout the political parties in Ireland that what was floated this week, albeit publicly, is completely unacceptable. And as our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, has repeatedly said this week, it should and will not be taken as a fait accompli. But in order to ensure that it doesn't become a fait accompli, it requires an intensive piece of work, um, as Martin has said, over the, or as Mark has said, over the next three months. And that requires work on an all-island basis um, of all parties and political figures, not in parties and, and various other groups. But it also requires work around um, around Great Britain, speaking with our friends um, throughout all the political parties in England, Scotland, Wales, but also, of course, with our friends in the United States. And I really must add that the work that the likes of Brendan and Congressman Neil have done over the last number of years, and indeed 
Speaker Pelosi for supporting the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process in the face of the hardest possible Brexit has been so important and so impactful. And of course, I would echo the call for an envoy to be appointed as soon as possible. Um, every envoy that has served in Northern Ireland has had a positive impact, uh, regardless of party or none. And it is certainly something that those of us on the ground um, would welcome ecstatically uh, if it was to occur, um, within, particularly within the next three months. But what can be done is the, is the lasting question many have asked, and I suppose it is the, the challenge to the wider of audiences. We know we have great friends on the Hill, like Brendan, like Richie, like others, but it's also to mobilise not just the AOH, but the wider Irish American community um, on this issue, because this issue matters to everyone with Irish blood in them. This matters to everyone in Ireland, regardless of where we stand on the political spectrum. Um, if we believe in the future of our country, we believe in delivering proper justice because until we pr deliver proper justice, we won't be able to deliver proper reconciliation. And that's what we all want, regardless of where we are or what political persuasion we come from. Uh, and I certainly, I know John is having some um, childcare slash uh, audio issues um, not too far away from me in extremely sunny sanding and, um, but to utilize John's skills on the Hill virtually or in person over the next few months would certainly be something that I, I will be putting to Minister Coveney and I would hope that would be embraced uh, by non-political um, actors as well in the US because I really don't want to add to the points that have been made uh, already but just to underline the serious concerns that we all have rights in society every government has a right to stake their claim and stake their opinion but everyone has a responsibility and the British government has very clear responsibilities to the Good Friday Agreement to the European Convention on Human Rights and this announcement runs a cart and horses once again through those responsibilities and it's important that we don't simply fall over on this one. And that's why I'm so happy, Danny, to receive the invitation to join this panel today and everything I can and will do will, will absolutely be put into force. Thank you, Neil. And before we move to uh, the United Kingdom, I just want to echo um, what's been said here today, how important it is to get the special envoy. And I think three months might have been a little bit too long for us. We'd like to have the special envoy uh, three months ago. But so we'll keep pushing here on our end for a special envoy. We've had such a great relationship with so many of these panelists, and we look to continue in our relationship with you. I do want to echo before we get too far along, Martin Galvin has talked about what a what a loss it's going to be for us when Karen Madden goes back to Ireland. And I just I want to I know I told everybody it seems like he just got here and he's leaving, but on behalf of the ancient order of Hibernians in America, Karen, we're going to miss you. But we look forward to continue working with you in whatever your next post is over in Ireland. And uh, we will be in Ireland as soon as you folks will let us in. The, uh, we're hoping that happens soon. If uh, God willing, we'll have um, John DC in the United States in the next couple of weeks. Um, I hope to be over uh, visiting you, Neil and others in uh, late no October, early November. And then we're gonna have a whole contingent with our Freedom for Ireland tour coming over in January. So anyone's interested in uh, traveling with Sean Pender and uh, Martin Galvin, uh, being part of the uh, 50th anniversary of the Bloody Sunday uh, commemoration and, and um, event, uh, get a hold of Sean and, and he'll get you uh, taken care of. Next up is someone who's uh, in a short time become a good friend of the Ancient Order of Hibernian. She serves as the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. She's a member of parliament for the Sheffield uh, constituency. Louise Haig, MP, was unable to make today's event um, live. However, she just spent time in the North of Ireland meeting with many of the uh, people on justice issues and taking uh, the Labour Party leader with her and trying to update more and more people in the United Kingdom of the issues. Uh, Tim, do we have her video set to go? Yes, we do. Can you see? No? No. Yeah. You can't see the video? Screen, screen share? Do you see it, Danny? No, sir. I nope. see it. Do you see it? Go ahead and go. Okay. Then. All right. I want to start by sending my solidarity to Jacqueline, Stephen, and Martin, who are joining you today. 
Like so many other people across Northern Ireland, they have spent decades searching for truth and justice after their lives were irrevocably changed by the events of the Troubles. And victims and survivors like them are owed truth and justice. And this government promised them that they would deliver that through the Stormont House Agreement, delivered and signed with the Irish government in 2014, and promised just 18 months ago when Stormont was re-established and the new decade, new approach was agreed. Promises made to victims and survivors in Northern Ireland should not be treated as the normal political promises jettisoned in Westminster by political parties in London. They should be treated with the utmost respect and it is imperative that the government proceed with Stormont House. It's nothing short of disgraceful that instead they have decided to rip up those proposals and deliver an amnesty to all those who committed troubles related offences. And the families of many of those victims who were murdered during the troubles have said this week that such an amnesty would be profoundly abhorrent. The UK Labour Party stands firmly with victims and survivors across Northern Ireland and indeed all those affected by the troubles and is remains committed to the Stormont House Agreement. So I just wanted to thank you all today for coming together to show your support and particularly to our friends in the US who continue to support the Good Friday Agreement and to put pressure on our government here in the UK to maintain and implement the Good Friday Agreement. The peace process has never been so fragile as it is now. I know all of you understand that very well and it's really important that we have a government that prioritises Northern Ireland, its people, its communities and that process. I just wanted to reiterate again uh, how committed we are uh, in the UK Labour Party and I am personally a Shadow Secretary of State. I'm sorry that I can't be with you um, live um, but I'm really grateful for you allowing me to address you with these brief remarks. Solidarity again and I look forward to seeing you all soon. And I just want to echo uh, what Louise uh, shared with us. She joined us for a webinar, our last webinar, um, when we were, had our Bally Murphy webinar. She joined us with less than 12 hours notice. Um, and if you follow the news and you hear her words, you will see that we have support um, from the United Kingdom. We have support from Ireland. We have support from the U.S. And I think everyone echoed how important it is for our audience to get involved and to speak up. I mean, I can tell you, I think everyone is well in favor of a uh, agreement, a trade agreement with the United Kingdom, as long as we commit and hold to all of the agreements they have already made. I think the United States has um, uh, bent over backwards to work continually with them uh, we have been so involved in the peace process, but it's time to actually honor the agreements that were made years and years ago. We can't just change uh, the agreements like we change our socks. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Karen Quinn, our Sinn Féin representative to the United States, for some comments. And then we will move through our panelists, if anyone has some comments, and then go to the questions for Jacqueline, Stephen, and Martin uh, from our first segment here today. Karen? I mean, thanks very much. And uh, I'd like to thank Martin, Jacqueline, and Stephen for their inputs today, because this demonstrates that this isn't some political issue without consequence. These are people who have been fighting for decades to get to the truth and justice in their own cases. And I think like all victims, there's all different scenarios and circumstances, but they all share the equal right to truth and justice, the human rights that they were promised in the Good Friday Agreement. And it, what is constant throughout this process is the British government have sought to frustrate those efforts and to cover up for their actions during the conflict. And come back to the point, all victims, regardless of the circumstance, are entitled to vindication of their rights. And the justice. And that is, I think, as Neil said, when you tie that into reconciliation. And people have mentioned the Good Friday Agreement, and I think it's worth remembering what was signed up in the Good Friday Agreement in relation to legacy. And it's at the very start of it. And it's the declaration of support from all the parties and both governments. And talking about the past, it talks about the, the regrettable legacy of the past, the suffering that people endured. And then to quote it, 
but we can best honour that through a fresh start in which we, we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance, mutual trust, and the protection and vindication of the human rights of all. That's the fundamental principle for signing up to the Good Friday Agreement. That is what is meant to be the basis for the British government's approach to it. And the proposals that they brought forward is not just a technical breach of that agreement. Look at what they're doing. They're closing down uh, investigations and they're saying to people who they claim to be their citizens that you cannot take us to court when we were responsible for the murder of your loved ones. So it's about uh, this is a government who is breaking international agreements and saying to their citizens, you have no access to legal recourse. That puts you very firmly in the position of a rogue state in anybody else's description. And I know people have talked about this, this government. And in terms of the, the states, I think we have to be mindful that it also contravenes the position both of the House resolution of 2019 which supported the full implementation of Stormont House and the Senate resolution of 2021, which also called for the full enforcement of the, uh, of the Stormont House. So I think that politically, and I don't know if Brandon's still there, but this is an issue that both, ho both houses of the Congress need to raise. They have skin in this game and they have a position in it and the British government are not listening to the Congress. I think there's an issue for the administration who say to support both the Storm House Agreement and the Good Friday Agreement and all that runs from it. And I suppose, lastly, and I'll, I'll just sum up, and it, I think it was a point that was, Danny, did you raise? And that is, the British government have always sought to frustrate the uncovering of truth in the cases where they have, they have played their hand. And I would be concerned with what is the process that's now been engaged in reopens Storm House for negotiation or puts it on hold. And the, the, I suppose the three, some of the outcomes that we could be looking at is the British government unilaterally act and end up tying this up for years in court cases or in endless negotiations. So I think there's a very real risk of that happening. And I think that that's why I come back to the key point. And it's the role of an envoy and with Danny you raised, this is no longer about renegotiating agreements. This is about implementing agreements. And a question has to be asked of the British government. What happens if they do not honour their agreements and do not implement their agreements? If an envoy is coming to Ireland, it should not be to renegotiate between the agreement, the Stormont House Agreement, and the British government's position. It should be very forcefully to say, you signed up to this. It needs to be implemented. And just lastly, on a, a point that shouldn't be forgotten, they're claiming that this is about reconciliation. And again, reconciliation has to be based on equal rights truth, justice, and respect. They say that this is a, a technical issue, that there's no, no way they're going to get prosecutions. But it's not up for a government to determine about prosecutions. It's up for the legal process to determine where there could be prosecutions. And again, it is highly unethical, undiplomatic, and goes beyond all standards of international uh, action where a government would actually stop that type of prosecution. It's, that's the role of the courts. So I think that, that need, they need to be challenged on that. The Congress needs to assert themselves. The Irish government need to assert themselves. The parties are all on board and assert themselves. But let's not get caught in the, another game of the British, which is a trend of frustrate and delay. It needs to be put up to them right, very clearly. You signed up to the, the, you signed up the Storm House Agreement and this government, this government, Boris Johnson signed up in January of last year to implement the Stormont House Agreement within 10, within 100 days. This is not an agreement that was foisted on him. He is part of this. He signed up to it. So I just think there's a lot of risk attendant to what the British government are doing, whether they try to overturn the rule of law, whether they try to stop citizens having access to the courts, or whether they're just trying to continually frustrate and delay this process. And I think the role of the states is crucial and it has to be very clear. The political process dictates that if you sign an agreement, it has to be honoured. And I think that is the essential role that you've highlighted for an envoy and for the administration and for Congress, quite clearly saying they're on the side of all victims, they're on the side of the agreements that were reached and they may need to be implemented. 
Thank you, Karen. And I think one of the things we have to remember as a, uh, as a group of people that why do we, why do we do what we do? And I, I, I think the reason we're still doing this is the historic way the uh, British government has chosen to delay, delay, delay. We're talking about items that are 50 years old or longer. Um, and we don't wanna pass this down to our children. And why are we all on this call? Why do we do this? We do this so we don't have to pass it down to our children. And that being said, we're gonna go uh, back to John Deasy, whose uh, young son was joining us today. And it's his son is why we do this. And from there, we're gonna go to Sean Pender. I mean, I'm sorry, to Dolores and then Sean, and then back to Martin for the questions. Uh, and then Tim, I, I think I have, uh, we have uh, Karen Quinn uh, highlighted somehow that I don't seem to be able to adjust. But next, uh, John DC. Okay, thanks. Sorry, sorry guys for the interruption. Um, I, I'll be quick because it's my second go. Um, I, I have to say, I, I, I disagree with some of the, the, um, the panelists with regard to um, <clears throat> our representation on Capitol Hill. And it's something I obviously am painfully aware of because I've been dealing with Capitol Hill uh, having worked there, but for the last four or five years, dealing exclusively with Capitol Hill. I don't think we have enough representation in places like the Senate. I don't think that we have nearly enough representation in, in the Republican side in the Senate. And when we're talking about, and Brendan Boyle mentioned this, a trade deal between the US and the UK, that's where you go. Uh, I think the British are testing the limits of congressional support for Ireland. Um, on issues like this. I think they're in some, in some ways are floating a very, very large kite. I don't think they know what the reaction um, is going to be. And I think they've factored in the displeasure of many Irish American members. And as Brendan Boyle said himself, the British are working on these guys constantly from the British embassy in DC. But when I go to the Senate, where trade deals are made um, exclusively almost, um, when it comes to the technical issues in the Senate Finance Committee, I don't see the support. I don't see the knowledge of the issues. Um, and frankly, I know what I'm talking about. And when I raise these issues um, with Republican staff in particular in the Senate, they have no knowledge and they need to. And what would surprise, surprise the British is that if two or three Republican members of the Senate Finance Committee raise this as an issue. The, the likes of Brendan Boyle and Richie Neal need assistance. They need help. And the, the British view that contingent of lawmakers as a known quantity. And I'm afraid that's the problem. And I think that that needs to change. So as far as I'm concerned, I think that that's where you looked, look to over the next three months um, when it comes to making an impact on British policy. Thank you, John. Uh, I appreciate those words. I think you, uh, you, you hit uh, the nail on the head there. And uh, we, we do need to look to that. And we will ask all of our members to work close with our senators and highlight uh, those issues that John just brought up, uh, brought forward. Next, we'll move to Dolores Desch, our ladies. National Freedom for Ireland Chair. Dolores, welcome. Thank you, Danny. Uh, really appreciate being on this webinar today with everyone. And I'd like to thank uh, Jacqueline, Martin, and Stephen for telling your stories. I know how difficult that can be for you. So thanks so much. Um, and you know, it, we're all talking about the truth coming out and, and how much energy the Brits put into hiding the truth. Um, a pan someone just put up a question about how come um, a lot of these records are sealed for so long. Uh, that, that's a big question I have whenever I read a report and they'll say, well, these records are now sealed until you know, 2060. Um, so that's a big issue, you know, the way that they're hiding the truth. And it's, it's groups like Relatives for Justice, Justice for the Forgotten, um, Paper Trail and Pat Finucane that are doing this work, pulling these, these records that are actual records from, from back during the conflict, during these cases, and bringing those to light. Um, I, I do have a question though for Mark, Mark Thompson. Um, 
So we talk about the European Convention on Human Rights, the European Court, the fact that there is um, a mechanism. How how much energy um, is in that in that area, um, and and how does that kind of become something that the rest of Europe is looking at? You know, we have we have a, a portion of the United States looking at this. What about other uh, European states, European members? Yeah, uh, well, the UK government before the 1998 peace agreement was the most indicted European member in terms of the convention or a signatory to the convention uh, than any signatory that is any other European government. And just, just for clarity, leaving the European Union is completely separate to the European Convention on Human Rights. It's a completely different um, entity. Actually, the European Convention, ironically, was drawn up as a human rights charter after the end of the Second World War to prevent uh, genocide and atrocities and the whole government state code of conduct where they could be held account. What has happened in, in, in 2000, we assisted with Madden and Finucane solicitors um, for landmark cases, the, the Loch Gall families, so, uh, the shoot kill incident at Loch Gall in May 1987, the killing of Pierce Jordan, an unarmed Republican shot by the RUC, the killing of three men in a shoot kill incident by the RUC in November 1982 uh, in Craigavon, County Armagh, and the killing of a Sinn Féin election worker um, uh, uh, up in Castle Derg, who'd been arrested 47 times and interrogated and told he would be murdered. They deter him from canvassing and doing his election work on behalf of Sinn Féin in a rural area in Tyrone. And those four cases went in May 2000. And in May 2001, there was an anonymous verdict from the European Court that the UK were in default uh, of the remedy to investigate these cases in Belfast and in the north, that the system had been rigged. And from that moment, the, the, you don't put a government in jail. The judgment is get passed from the European Court to Strasbourg to the Committee of Ministers for the execution of judgments. And what happens is then the European uh, uh, commissioners supervise the UK to ensure that they rectify and remedy and put in place proper investigative mechanisms to look at all these incidents. And from May 2001, save for a short period of several months, almost 20 years later, the UK are still under supervision by the Committee of Ministers in Strasbourg. There's closed sessions in which the governments, the Irish government, have been very forceful in those sessions around the issue of Pat Finucane and around all these issues and holding the UK to account. That's why the framework around Stormont House was predicated on the European Convention and Article 2 and the proper investigations where the UK couldn't enter them. And that's why it's trying to reverse out of that, because they apply that would mean that the British would have to open up those files that you've just talked about. They'd have to provide families with disclosure and discovery. There are 900 civil cases in Belfast High Court around killings and shootings and injuries. Uh, all suing the British government, the PSNI and the MOD and the intelligence services for their either their role directly in the murders or for misfeasance and wrongdoing and collusion and cover up. There are Thank police ombudsmen. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we. No, fair we enough. We're going to move on. Uh, we're on a. We're on a. We're up against the end of the uh, webinar. Thank you, Dolores. Uh, before we move to Sean, I just want to recognize we had three national presidents, past national presidents, joining us: Judge James McKay, our immediate past president; Brandon Moore, uh, who was a longtime Freedom for Ireland chair; and Ned McGinley, who's in the uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame and has uh, been a long supporter of all of our. Um, of all of our issues with Freedom for Ireland, we're going to move to Sean and back to um, and, and back to Martin. And we want to keep all comments and questions at that time to our three initial speakers um, and Sean Pender. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Martin, for putting this together. And I uh, like well, everyone else. Um, um, thank Jacqueline, Stephen, and Martin for your testimony. We commend your your courage and persistence. And we stand by you. You know, over the last week, some of the comments we've heard, I, I think the most reprehensible statement by Lewis was to the effect that the system's not working. Well, anybody on this call should know the system's not working because the British have done everything in their power to deny the truth and to obstruct the justice. They have signed on to the Good Friday Agreement, the Weston Park Agreement, the Stormont House Agreement, the New Decade, New Approach Agreement, and they failed to live up to their commitments in each and every one of them. 
despite purposefully delaying, delaying and making it longer than it had to the civil inquiry and doing the best to stall the Valley Murphy inquest, the truth has come out. And that is what they are deathly afraid of. And then the apologies that they issue to those survivors are not worth the paper they're written on. The victors and, and survivors simply deserve truth and justice. And our friends at Relatives for Justice this week, I think, have started a, a beautiful program to personalize it, the Never Giving Up campaign, where the families have once again stated that despite the actions of Johnson and the British government, they will continue their quest for justice. And, and over the years, I've met many of these families. And to the families of the likes of Jack Duffin and Gary Campbell and Paul McWilliams and Colin McGurr and Peter Gallagher and Kevin Barry O'Donnell and Nora McCabe and Caroline Moreland and Sheena Campbell and David McCaffrey and so hundreds and hundreds of more, know that the AOH and Irish America is never giving up. And we join you and the hundreds of others more in your quest for justice. We will continue to lobby for the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement and to do as what Kieran and Madden said, to continue to make noise, to try to get this process right. We will work with our friends uh, on Congress and the Senate to make sure that any trade deal includes the full limitation of the Good Friday Agreement, which includes the truthful addressment of legacy. We will stand by the victims and the survivors until we get that right. Thank you to all who have participated in today's uh, program. Great words uh, from our National Vice President, longtime Freedom for Ireland Chair, Sean Pender. Um, I've heard Sean say once, I've heard him say it a thousand times. The whole problem is the British plan of deny, delay, delay, deny. And uh, we should get t-shirts uh, for, for them to wear when they're out. And at this time, we'll go back to Martin. Um, I think what we'll do, uh, Tim, do we have some questions uh, for the act for our first three speakers? Uh, yes, we do. Um, All right, so Martin, if you'll uh, take over as moderator and Tim will uh, share those questions. All right, just one second. All right, I, I, I just wanted to make just a very quick statement. The saddest thing about doing this webinar was how many different people we could have brought in who had the same st type of story, the same heartbreak as Jacqueline, as Stephen, as Martin. These stories, Spring Hill, West Rock community, all of these stories, the 17 people with Martin Mallon, the people who were victims of the Glen Ann gang, like Stephen Travers, we could have gone over and around the country and bring people like that. And the British are trying to say no justice to any of them. If Storm and House had been implemented five years ago, we might have been finished and gotten justice for all these people. Instead, they delay it. And when people still continue to fight, they want to just end any possibilities. Sorry, Denny, go ahead. Tim. Go ahead, Tim. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a couple, there's several questions that I've kind of uh, combined several. Uh, U.S. political uh, pressure seems to be the only way Britain will listen. Uh, the British government wants to protect their army and their staff. Uh, and the Irish want truth and justice, not just truth or justice. Uh, what ways can we achieve the truth and justice in, in our current format? Uh, I don't know. Uh, do, do you want me to take that, Danny? Do you want me to refer to somebody? Um, it's Go an ahead. American question. Look, we just have the Storm and House Agreement. We just have going through to forward. It's not simply a matter that these things are not working, as Sean Penda said. It's a matter that the British government won't let them work. So all we want is, or all people in Ireland have been asking for is for the Storm and House Agreement, for those mechanisms to actually work. That's the time for truth appeal that Mark Thompson and others had in January. Uh, for the courts to work, for inquest to go forward and to get the funding, that's what Jacqueline Butler and the Spring Hill West Rock families want. All they are asking for is to allow the truth to go forward, for the British to take an up uh, the posture that they won't delay, deny, and, and hope the people die, as Danny and Sean have mentioned, that they'll actually cooperate, let those things work, say that mistakes were made, uh, but people are now entitled to justice, and then true reconciliation can begin. And we're hopeful, if they listen to America, they're worried about America, then let's make them listen and worry about America more by pushing pressure in America on our Congress. Thank you. What we're going to do now, folks, is we're going to move to closing comments. We'll go from Martin Milan to Stephen Travers, and conclude with our good friend from Bowflast, uh, Jacqueline Butler. Martin, if you would unmute, Mark Mallon, and, and uh, your any comments you have to close the uh, session. 
Yes, I'd just like to thank everybody that participated in this event today. And um, I think I can't emphasise enough how important the role of the AOH and Congress people in America. If we have these people on board and pushing the case for us here and in, in the Irish government, um, we're, we're pretty isolated because um, as you talk about this British government, I think they're all under themselves now and um, that the people as they always did here didn't exist. So they, they would intend to walk over us once again. So we depend on you very, very much for your support and for your help. And I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. We, we certainly appreciate your time. Stephen Travers. You're muted, Stephen. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, thank you again. Uh, it's uh, it's very heartening to be in your in uh, your company, especially Jacqueline and and Mark. Um, if I can just uh, address the the sobering uh, uh, interjection that that John DC made there, with regard to anybody anybody uh, Irish Americans that may be complacent or think that it didn't happen to them, let me just point something out: that the intention on the night that we were attacked. The plan was not just to attack a band, a pop group. That, that was, wasn't a, a enough for them. Had they successfully framed us and had they successfully uh, um, told the world that, that this band that was loved, universally loved and made up of Catholics and Protestants were, were gun runners or were, were terrorists, that was one thing. But had it worked that any member of the Senate any member of Congress with an Irish name would have been pulled over to the side when entering, uh, getting on an airplane, an, air, an airport anywhere in the world. They tried to demonize the Irish. They tried to frame every one of us as gun runners to take the credibility from decent people. That's something that perhaps uh, our good friends in the Senate and, and uh, uh, Congress uh, should, should understand that they were not, they're not just, it's not just something that happened to somebody else. This, this was an effort to frame every single Irish person in the world, especially with an Irish name, as terrorists. John, did you have a follow-up to that with uh, Stephen, quickly? Yeah, Stephen, I, I totally agree with that, but I think you need to bring it to a, another level. But I think you're, you're getting to, to, that's kind of, I think, what you mean. By, by that, I mean, I think that you need to go beyond people who are Irish-American. There are people in the United States Senate, Republicans who are interested in human rights issues. There is a human rights caucus in the United States Senate. Um, there are people who have been on that caucus, you know, for the last you know, six years since it was founded. That's where you go. You, you tell that story to those people, some of whom are on the Senate Finance Committee. And I think they are people who would be interested and their staffs would be interested in this issue. And I think it's a new departure, but I think that needs to happen. Again, I will say that I think the British view the contingent of Irish American lawmakers on the Hill as a known quantity. And I think they're testing the waters here a little bit. I think we need to broaden the net here. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I enjoyed your words. I, I'm one that will re-watch re this uh, video in a, about an hour. And just to hear it again, it's so hard to take everything in that we... Um, we got from all of you, all of our guests, and it is available on our YouTube, the Ancient Order Hibernians YouTube channel. Uh, we will also break out some segments of this um, so you could watch individual parts. And uh, But Jacqueline, your closing comments and words, please. We just want to thank you, our family and the rest of families. Really appreciate what you are doing and trying to help us get justice that we our families deserve um we just we really appreciate it and we're hoping to can have your continued support and helping us actually just get the truth thank you very much thank you jacqueline and and, and this brings our uh event today to an end um to end on a lighter note uh brendan boyle sent me a text and he said to please apologize for judge mckay he didn't realize that his picture with the judge was behind him and not off to the side so everyone could see that. But Judge, he wanted to know that you to know that he did have that picture there. Um, as we end so much, so many of our um, events, we're going to go to Rockland County, uh, one of our largest, if I mean our largest county in membership. And we're going to go to their 1916, 2016 commemoration of the Easter Rising. 
and thank you all for being here today. Oh. Uh -huh.